Hi everyone, back again. We're going to try to cut to the chase today, not have such a prolonged session. Um, so even briefer review today, uh, we've been talking about the threat stress response and specifically a lot about what threat is and how it activates uh, a stress response that if it goes on chronically can become quite toxic to us. And uh, as you remember, the, the amygdala, two of them, one in each temporal lobe, is the, the center of uh, the threat stress response. This is where we register threat uh, in our brains. And we've talked about all the different things that can uh, pose a threat to us. And we started with things in the body, like if you sprain an ankle or step on a nail or break a bone, that's going to signal the system that, uh-oh, we got some tissue damage here. Be alert. Uh, you need to uh, find a way to be safe and heal. Um, we've talked about even uh, our organs, our viscera, uh, and how if, if we have appendicitis or an ulcer, it's going to stimulate the threat stress response. We've talked about how disease and chronic illness can stimulate uh, the threat stress res response chronically. Most specifically, we've been talking about how a virus can activate the threat stress response. And in this case, the um, COVID-19 virus, we've talked about how bacteria does the same thing. Lions, tigers, and bears, as well as physically threatening people can activate the threat stress response. But other people um, can also, through uh, an emotional toxicity, through an emotional uh, trauma, uh, uh, kind of burn us and, and, and cause uh, emotional um, pain, spiritual pain, social pain, and that will activate the threat stress response. We've talked about how our own thoughts, negative thoughts, uh, can activate our threat stress response. And we talked quite a bit about the subconscious brain, the, this, this shadowy brain kind of below the cortex where we house um, uh, predictive codes that are designed to constantly survey our environment for safety versus danger, for threat. And if it is uh, um, predisposed uh, by past traumas to running a lot of uh, predictive codes uh, searching for threat, it, it, it may flag threat more easily uh, in somebody who's had those past traumas than in somebody who hasn't and give you a chronic threat stress response. And we talked about some of the things we do in terms of suppressing thoughts, compartmentalizing them or, re or repressing emotions, stuffing our emotions, and how that energy, um, when we do that, it's usually because we don't want to feel or deal with those emotions in the middle of something else we're, we're doing. So we want to put them aside, but then we never come back to deal with them so they exist again in the shadows of the mind or the shadows of the brain as this uh, chronic energy that keeps poking at the, the threat center and activating it um, and causing this cascade of events uh, that uh, is the threat stress response. It can be acute and short-lived, which isn't bad. It builds resilience in us, but if it's chronic and goes on for a long time, it can be very toxic to us. And the mediators of that in general, or many more, but um, uh, are adrenaline and cortisol. Those are activated through our hormone system uh, and uh, our blood and specifically the adrenal gland pumping those out. But the signal starts up in here um, primarily. And then we have a, a lot of transmitters. We've talked more about noradrenaline uh, because it's particularly uh, relevant to this conversation than we have about things like dopamine and serotonin and acetylcholine, um, but they're also all relevant and uh, they tend to be more feel-good type neurotransmitters uh, uh, that uh, kind of start to go offline when we're under threat stress. Uh, we've talked about uh, glutamate as an excitatory uh, transmitter that kind of jacks us up and helps um, um, enhance our senses. So we're very plugged into our environment. It also helps create memories of uh, a stressful or traumatic event so that we don't forget the next time. 
adds to these little predictive codes as well. Uh, and we talked about histamines enhancing the inflammatory response and typically uh, uh, it's an allergic type uh, uh, inflammatory response when we're talking about histamines. And then we spent a lot of time talking about the pro-inflammatory cytokines and they have just a, a, a significant role in the threat stress response, both acutely and chronically. And unfortunately, in chronic threat stress, they can uh, present a, a problem in terms of, of uh, toxicity. Um, and, uh, and we talked specifically about how people who have uh, the COVID-19 uh, virus and have a high uh, threat stress load, layers and layers and layers of threat stress coming from all of these things, now a big virus on top of it, and perhaps then fear, anxiety, and escalating into panic, get a huge cytokine load, and that's been referred to as a cytokine storm. And that cytokine storm uh, is actually what people are dying from. They're not dying from this, this viral load per se, it's the combined effects of the threat stress from the viral load with everything else they have uh, uh, going on in their body that is, is also increasing that threat stress load and, and age plays a, a factor as well. So one of the things that uh, um, became important in this, in, in this scenario is not, not always just focusing on the interface with the virus and the cells and the replication of the virus and the distribution around the body, that, that kind of, you know, uh, microscopic uh, uh, interface of, of the viral, uh, the virus itself and our, our uh, uh, cells, but uh, focusing on um, the threat stress response and how sometimes it, it doesn't help us um, when, uh, we're, when we're pushing towards a, a cytokine storm, um, the threat stress response acutely in, in sort of a fight or flight physiology or a, a hypermetabolic physiology uh, characterized by fever and, uh, and high immunity, uh, uh, lots of immune cells circulating and very active as well as high cytokines helps to kick the crap out of the virus but if that load of cytokine gets too high and we start to um, get exhausted uh, and to lose the battle that we can easily uh, flip into freeze and faint uh, physiology and that's where we uh, start to collapse and potentially pass. Um, we drop our heart rate, our blood pressure, um, our uh, respiratory rate drops, our temperature then starts to drop as well. Uh, yeah, we don't mount as good of a, a, fe a fever response to help kill the virus um, and our white cells um, aren't as active. They don't work as well to fight off the bug. Um, so that, that tipping point of going from fight or flight and getting after the virus uh, to going into sort of freeze faint uh, collapse is really something that we want to try to avoid. Um, and we even talked a little bit about uh, hydroxychloroquine or plaquenil and how it, it, it might intervene uh, in that process. It, it may uh, somehow prevent the virus entering the cell or the virus replicating, or perhaps it's a very good uh, cytokine blocker, pro-inflammatory cytokine blocker, so it may actually just intervene in that window uh, to, uh, um, to prevent um, going into a complete uh, faint and collapse response based on a cytokine storm. We even talked about though, uh, we have to be very careful about that because if it is working by that mechanism to take Plaquenil prophylactically or too soon might impair fighting off the virus uh, and make us sicker. So um, taking it uh, you know, in an uh, appropriate uh, timing may be part of the key and that's what we don't know about and that's why it's a little bit dangerous just to say, well, let's put everybody on Plaquenil and see what happens because we might up, end up doing harm and our oath is at first do no harm. So having said all that, that's kind of a quick uh, synopsis. Uh, what I want to talk about today is, well, how do, how do we quiet down this amygdala? This, 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 these 
uh, the two of them are the source of this whole thing getting overly jacked up uh, and, and causing some uh, problems down, downstream. So even prior to getting the virus, we want to be attending to this and then, you know, we'll let it run wild a little bit while, while it's beating the crap, while we're beating the crap out of the virus, but not too long. And then we need to, you know, try to re-engage it and shut it down um, uh, so that we don't go into collapse and pass away. So um, let's just go to the basics over here. Some of the basic stuff that we can do is get good sleep. So sleep is really restorative for us and it, and it helps um, not only uh, for um, restoring our body, but also restoring our brains, you know, uh, getting our brain rebalanced and the neurotransmitters rebalanced and making us feel good. And it starts to shut down when we get good restorative sleep, the activity of the threat stress response. So sleep is cer certainly uh, a, a basic uh, in dealing with this. Now, if you are in fight or flight and you're feverish and you're a little restless or agitated, uh, that type of thing, you know, that, that may be a little harder to do. If you're just stressed out in fight or flight, you know, you're gonna perhaps suffer from a little bit of insomnia. So you need to take on all these things to allow yourself to get good sleep. And we did talk the other day about the fact that melatonin um, can be very helpful, um, not only in initiating sleep, but it has some interesting uh, properties in, in helping the immune system and actually controlling the cytokine system. And it's very, very safe to take. Um, so it's not a bad idea to take it two hours Prior to when you want to go to sleep, people try to take it like a sleeping pill. It won't work that way. Uh, it has a much slower onset. Um, and as long as you're doing that, uh, get away from your screens and your technology in that window and start dealing with some of this other stuff that might be uh, more healing for you. Uh, we also talked about the importance of nature. We're living in concrete jungles. Uh, we didn't evolve that way. Uh, we evolved very integrated into the natural world and uh, just the beauty of the natural world is soothing to us, uh, let alone, you know, just getting our focal point out in the distance. We're, we weren't meant to be like this all day long. So getting out there, seeing nature, seeing, you know, sunrises and sunsets and stars and blue sky and cloudy skies and and greenery and the flowers are now coming out and, um, and, and that's soothing to our soul. That's how we evolved and, and we, there is a, a diagnosis now of nature deficit disorder and it's probably uh, epidemic if not pandemic in this world. So um, I do wanna point out also, there's some really interesting research about uh, things that are in the soil and things that are in the air uh, in, in forests that uh, can actually act like um, uh, pheromones or hormones and can act perhaps like serotonin or at least stimulate our serotonin, which we talked about these little nuclei make that. And it's a relatively chill neurotransmitter that makes us um, uh, feel good and content and want to connect and bond. So uh, nature's a big deal and it's, and it's overlooked for us. If you're in a concrete jungle and there's no, no nature, get out and see the sky. The sky is there. Uh, you can look at it in awe and take deep breaths and bring that oxygen into your body and particularly into the bottom of your lungs to help get rid of any bugs down there. Good food. We talked about good food and just a real simple formula for, uh, for good food is by... Um, whole unprocessed, preferably free range type foods uh, and get a variety of colors. That is all you need to know. Uh, no, one more thing. So you get to go in the fruit and vegetable aisle, maybe grab some nuts in that aisle. They seem to be putting them there now. Um, and then go into your, uh, your meat, poultry, fish aisle, get some good protein. Uh, and if you tolerate dairy, go ahead and get some dairy uh, and then get out of the store, unless you need gel or hand wipes or something like that. But uh, eat, uh, eat well. That type of a diet uh, is uh, anti-inflammatory in its nature and helps boost your immune system. It also uh, prevents uh, fat deposition 
uh, and some of the toxicity that uh, comes with obesity in addition to other comorbid, comorbid medical diagnoses that can come uh, with uh, obesity. Um, now, we have to comment that under fight or flight, you know, when we're stressed out, um, it's very natural for us to crave simple carbohydrates, to crave sugar, because when we're running from the tiger, it's not really time to, you know, take a big meal full of fiber and fat and protein. We can't digest it. Um, so when we're running from the tiger, you know, grabbing something that's easy to digest, it's got a lot of sugar in it to keep the fuel going is really helpful. But if we're sitting inside and our house is in isolation watching TV and we're kind of giving in to that fight or flight um, uh, bias or, or predisposition to wanting simple carbohydrates and sugary foods, that becomes problematic. Now, we're taking in these calories that jack up you know, our insulin and shove all that stuff into fat cells and, and, and that's not good for us. Even fat cells secrete cytokines. So it becomes really problematic to, uh, to do that. So uh, as much as you can, avoid the sugary foods. If you happen to be you know, uh, 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 acutely infected with the virus and, and you're a little hypermetabolic and having a fever, you know, then actually probably having some of those simple uh, carbs and sugary type stuff makes some sense because you'll burn it up. Your, your immune system is jacked and it's going to be able to use that sugar to kind of fight things off. But, you know, that's only two, three days. And then you got to get back on a pretty solid diet. Um, so we're, you know, we're talking about food and nature, good smells. You know, there's so much out there uh, in nature right, right now. Uh, the, the, the flowers are coming out. You can find blooms. You know, favorite thing that I love to do when I'm walking is find lavender or rosemary and grab a handful of it and grind it up in my hands, get the oils out, and then take deep breaths. Of, of that, but you know, and then and then foods can have great uh, smells as well. That's soothing to your to your body. That that is something that really is kind of at a subconscious level that uh, unravels the the tension and the and the stress response in your in your body. So take advantage of it. It's kind of fun and and it's and it's natural and it's a do no harm thing. Good taste, obviously. You know, having just some great uh, great food. Uh, not only, you know, does, does it taste good going down and you get a little full and you get a little sleepy, it actually activates our, our nucleus ambiguous, our feel good, our, our feed and breed, our uh, rest and digest, our sex and relax part of our brain. And when we do that, it helps to shut down the amygdala and it, spewing out kind of the, the threat stress um, cascade of hormones and chemicals. Um, so, so, you know, uh, don't overindulge, but make sure you indulge your stuff, your, yourself with stuff you really like. Uh, good sound. Take, a, take advantage of another one of our senses. It's very natural to us. So, uh, you know, uh, um, when we're stressed out, our, 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 our vocal cords tighten up. We get a, a different frequency and even a different volume to our voice, particularly in fight or flight. Those aren't necessarily soothing to us. They actually uh, activate our threat stress response. We're more alert for things like sirens and screeching and stuff. So, so we want to get out of that mode. So we want to find those calming, low frequency, um, uh, kind of easy listening stuff. I like country music and I can usually find plenty of songs like that uh, listening to country music um, but sometimes it's really just as simple as um, as finding vibration uh, that not only resonates with us in our hearing system but can resonate through our, our body so some people you know that like to chant uh, or uh, you can sing as well or but chanting brings on this whole vibratory sensation in your head and your body um, you know people have vibrating bowls or percussion stuff not only gives you a good sense of sound and vibration but it has a rhythm and synchronicity to it that we really like and if you can uh, even incorporate other people into that and kind of get that resonance going that calms us it's it's so basic but it calms us and yet you, you start looking at primitive cultures 
around some of this stuff and they all kind of incorporated this into not only the, the, the culture and the social experience, but the healing experience as well. Um, good touch. So, you know, there may be some days where light touch feels good, some days maybe it's, it's, it's vibration, and some days you just want a little extra pressure in, you know, kind of in those knots and the muscles uh, to, to get things loosened up. But uh, touch is important to us, and again, it, 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 uh, it deactivates our stress response, um, it helps to release sex hormones, anabolic or building hormones, uh, and oxytocin, a natural pain relieving chemical that also helps with our bonding and makes us more social and feel better in general. So um, uh, touch is important. Um, uh, another uh, nice thing to do is take a nice warm bath. I love it with Epsom salts or magnesium salts because magnesium is a relaxing um, chemical for us. It is uh, Calcium tends to be activating and it's its counterbalance and it's and it's what your Epsom salts are are made of So you get not only the magnesium, but you get some heat and heat tends to be relaxing for us uh, Viruses don't particularly like heat. That's why we spike a fever uh, Is to help kill off uh, a virus I will say that sometimes when you're injured, you know, and you've got an acutely inflamed joint or something you want to control it Ice is great, but ice is actually uh, cold is actually a stressor. So uh, cold will, will tend to activate some of this same threat stress response. So I really do recommend uh, uh, for uh, dampening this response that you look to, to heat. And if you don't have a bathtub, you know, an, a, a nice hot shower, again, the, the, the shower itself is a, a little bit like a massage. It will, it will help significantly. Um, so we're talking about taking a little bit of time every day for self-care by just doing these things, being mindful of getting these into, into your daily life. Um, we also talked about exercise. I kind of put that a little bit below that level of attending to self-care simply because what we talked about in a previous session was if you're in fight or flight, or if you're in a calm state, exer exercise may be very therapeutic for you. Um, but if you're actually kind of working your way into that freezer faint physiology, where you know you just don't have any energy, or you're having a hard time just sitting up for very long, let alone walking uh, or getting exercise, I think you gotta be careful in that window and respect what your body's telling you. It's actually saying, I'm running out of steam. Um, you know, I need to conserve some resources. I need to take some time uh, to rest and recover and repair and, and forcing yourself, sort of the compulsion to say, okay, exercise is good. Not always, exercise is good, but not always. And to be able to take a step back and say, you know, I need to take this day off or I need to take this week off you should still move you should still get up and move around you should still try to get outside and get some fresh air but uh doing your routine uh exercise workout may not be the most appropriate thing uh when either you're you're just really low in energy in general uh or um or you're kind of in that stage of fighting off the virus so and then uh, uh, kind of these are really, really basic down here. You know, the idea of laughing and crying, we, we talked about, uh, you know, uh, being aware of our emotions um, and, uh, and kind of fully exploring those. Um, but, you know, laughter is super restorative. Um, so you don't need to put on the movie Contagion, you know, put on something that's gonna gonna make you laugh and e even a belly laugh is is better than just a chuckle so uh, find time for for humor in your life even in these serious times really important um and then you know if you're there if you you know if you if you you are fed up exhausted overwhelmed and you're feeling this energy in you um, a good cry is very restorative. It resets things. 
it resets this thing. But if you go, oh man, you know, I'm not doing that. You know, I'm gonna hold it together. I'm gonna be strong. Well, sometimes that's actually not being that strong because what you're doing is you're taking the emotions and, and again, you're stuffing them, you're repressing them and they aren't necessarily gonna go away, right? You, they may go out of consciousness but they're gonna go up into the shadows and hang out there and poke at this amygdala uh, until you deal with them. So uh, that, you know, having a good cry. You know, I think uh, women are much better at that than, uh, than men. I think uh, we're culturally scripted, you know, just don't go there. And, it, and it, it costs us, you know, and you could make up all kinds of theories about why we live uh, two years less than than our our, uh, our female counterparts, um, and you know this is probably a a, a good piece of that. Um, okay, so that's kind of what I thought would be the basics. Um, but if we now go over here to uh, some stuff that's you know a, a little bit a little bit more uh, strategic uh, that we should be doing, um, we talked about the other day the importance of doing your breath work. So a six count in, getting deep uh, breaths in, getting air all the way to the bottom of your lungs, uh, and then hold for two and a four count out. So that's just nourishing to us uh, to do that. Um, and arguably uh, fully um, inflating our lungs helps to prevent uh, the development of, of some significant lung issues, particularly in the face of infection. But the other part of breath work is our automatic nervous system, our autonomic nervous system is autonomic. It kind of runs on its own and it is a little bit hard for us uh, to uh, control it and override it. But one of the things that we can use to kind of get a little bit of control over this automatic part of our, our nervous system is uh, breath work. So um, our, our centers that uh, drive uh, our respiratory rate uh, and uh, heart rate um, are uh, in the brainstem way down here. And uh, when we're doing a deep breathing activity, uh, we get uh, input coming into here that helps to um, quiet the overall system at the, at the level of the brainstem, almost at a, a very primitive reptilian reflex level. Um, but we know with breath work, what we end up seeing is this uh, nucleus ambiguous uh, comes online, and we know when it comes online, uh, it helps to um, shut, out, shut down the flow coming out of the amygdala that uh, if it goes on too long and chronic, you know, becomes toxic to us. So breath work is super important to do and kind of basic. Uh, if you want to look something up, there is um, a fellow out there who's super brilliant by the name of Stephen Porges, who um, developed something called the polyvagal uh, theory. And uh, he talks a lot about uh, the neuroanatomy and neurobiology, not just of the brainstem, but the interfaces that, that we're talking about. Um, and it's just, uh, it's just fabulous stuff. And it's, and it's filtered through all of the things that we've been uh, talking about here. Um, and then we also, um, in a previous session, talked about sensory emo emotion awareness and sens sensory emotion integration. Um, and that's just simply recognizing what's going on in your body, what's going on in the, uh, the, your extremities and your spine, but also recognizing what's going on uh, in your viscera or kind of your organ system and recognizing that the fascia that uh, flows throughout our body, like one very thin but pervasive organ system uh, has this visceral innervation, uh, and then uh, trying to check in with your emotions and seeing if you can actually identify what they are. It's harder than it seems. And then uh, once you have kind of identified where you are emotionally, going back in and checking in with your body and your viscera and seeing if those emotions are actually popping up somewhere in your body. And you know, the kind of the suggestions were sometimes if you're sad, 
you know, they pop up in your stomach and if you're anxious sometimes something will be there in, in the chest, a tightness or something. Sometimes if you're angry, you know, things tend to pop up in the muscles of the, of the upper back, the neck, uh, the low back, the butt, and even up into the jaw. And, uh, and there's that kind of emotional wiring that runs so closely uh, with our visceral, visceral wiring uh, that they get reflected in each other. They're never separate from each other. Um, and then the other thing that I think is super important to do to deal with uh, the shadows, the shadow energy that we're talking about, the predictive codes and the suppressions and repressions and traumatic memories that are not immediately available to us is uh, to try to offload that system by doing expressive activities. So uh, expressive movement, uh, which you know can be done in, in silence and just whatever you feel, you just you're gonna just go with it. Or you know if you want to add uh, something from the basics list, you know put on a little music and roll with it. That's super therapeutic um, and it keeps you moving and healthy. Um, I think also uh, expressive drawing, whatever comes to mind, you put it on paper. You don't have to be an artist. It can be stick figures. Uh, but you are just letting whatever comes through, whatever bubbles up into your consciousness goes down on the paper. Um, you can do something similarly with painting. I think watercolors are, uh, are kind of nice. You know, it's a little bit more abstract. You're not, you don't get too hyper-focused on uh, painting the perfect leaf or something like that. You just get the, the, the use of colors and in, in, in your emotions coming out to, uh, just like the, the, the uh, what is it called, the feeling wheel that's all color coded. You can kind of go with whatever color you want a lot of times and you can see I put red up here for the amygdala uh, as being sort of the threat color. Uh, you know, we think of uh, being angry and, and, and kind of the, the red face and everything. So, you know, if you're, if you're angry, you may end up with a lot of red in your, uh, in your painting. If you're if you're feeling really calm and kind of chill, you might end up with some blues and purples. I don't know. Just make it up. doesn't matter. And you can always throw it all away at the end. Try not to hang on to it. Try not to judge it. Um, try not to produce a significant product out of it. And same rules for expressive writing. You know, whatever bubbles up, get it down on paper. It doesn't have to be sentences. Uh, you don't even have to be able to read your writing. Every other word can be a swear word doesn't matter, just get it out, let it out. And we know we have literature that uh, demonstrates that doing this, maybe not specifically as to what we've been talking about, but uh, it deactivates the stress system and boosts our immunity. You know, um, so it, you know, I, it's not drilled down to the point where we can tell you every hormone and transmitter and chemical that does that but it does that. So we said, you know, do these expressive activities with a sense of play. Relatively spontaneous, no clear purpose, no clear outcome. You're just doing it and you're not judging it. Um, and then some other things that have been proven over time to be really helpful to, uh, to modulate the threat stress response and boost our immunity uh, include some of the, the more structured movement type therapies uh, uh, and activities like yoga, tai chi, and qigong, and uh, uh, this is certainly there's there's plenty of uh, opportunities to go online and initiate uh, a class, uh, a study, a, and a practice in these areas, and they have stood the test of time. Obviously, um, meditation is also excellent, um, you know, and particularly. Um, you know, learning to let these um, thoughts go through your head, um, recognizing that thoughts are not reality, they're just thoughts, uh, and, uh, and allowing them to sort of float through, uh, like watching the, the clouds go overhead without necessarily having to react to them. Um, and uh, you get your mindfulness in, you get your breath work in, and you get some great relaxation in, and you're retraining your whole system to be calmer and less 
reactive, particularly uh, to things uh, like uh, your thoughts and other people's uh, input. Um, so again, you can use this time to adopt a meditation practice, but as I've said before, if you're in fight or flight, uh, that kind of, everything in your body is now geared towards mobilization and movement uh, to find safety and survival. So the idea of, of sitting and doing relaxation training or, or uh, uh, meditation uh, can be fighting your physiology. And I actually don't recommend that. Um, you know, we, we know where conflict exists in the brain and, and, uh, and how the, when we have things that are in conflict, you know, down here in the, in the shadows or, or, or right, sitting right into an area of our brain called the anterior cingulate cortex, it directly talks to the amygdala and gets it jacked up. So we don't really want you uh, on the ground or, or, or sitting to try to practice meditation and finding it miserable. Uh, it, it shouldn't feel like that. Um, and then um, some of the other really important practices, uh, you know, we talked about the need to, in a previous session, the need to let go of things like anger and guilt. They are there for a purpose. They signal us to attention, uh, but they are not good to hang on to chronically. They keep this guy activated and eventually uh, become toxic to us. Um, so, uh, and I struggled with a quote in a previous session of, from N Nelson Mandela, but uh, it was basically holding on to anger is like drinking poison and hoping the other person dies. Um, so it's always good to remember. But we also know the practice of gratitude, even gratitude journaling um, is therapeutic for shutting this guy down and helping our immunity. And we know that uh, forgiveness, and forgiveness is not forgetting, we, we forgive uh, so that we can let go and we can let go of that negative energy and that helps to shut this down. And you know, this is really very much kind of the uh, practice of traditional prayer um, where, you know, prayer shouldn't be going in and saying, hey, I want a red Ferrari and then the next day going in and saying, you know, I'm pissed off. I didn't get the red Ferrari. Can I have a red Ferrari? You know, it's really about um, having gratitude, being thankful for what we do have, uh, and it's about uh, uh, forgiveness, and that forgiveness is forgiving ourselves uh, and other people. And I think that's really important in times like this, because we know, based on our conversation in a previous session, that when we're under threat stress, um, these certain parts of our brain go offline, and we become unreasonable, and we become selfish, and we do bad things, and we say bad things when we're under threat and stress. And it's important that we recognize that in ourselves, and we also recognize that in other people. When you see somebody who is decompensating, and yelling, and screaming, and swearing, and not uh, really participating in kind of rational thought, or what we would consider um, socially appropriate, you can at least step back and go, wow, he must be under a lot of threat stress. I feel sorry for him, but I'm gonna walk the other way. Yeah, so, um, but yeah, gratitude and forgiveness are things that have been proven to be helpful for us in deactivating our threat stress response, uh, jacking up our immunity and giving us an overall, overall sense of, uh, of wellness. Um, and then we have the psychotherapies, which can be helpful psychoanalysis or cognitive behavioral therapy or dialectic, dialectic behavioral therapy. And those things also help us with kind of uh, understanding ourselves, understanding where we came from, uh, and, uh, and then understanding our thinking process and uh, when we're going down rabbit holes to kind of reformat things. And they can be done uh, kind of in, uh, in, um, uh, in uh, the area of, of, uh, of mindfulness and relaxation and calming as well. Uh, so these can be very helpful. However, again, if you are in fight or flight or freeze or faint, and these cortical functions are offline, to spend a lot of time 
uh, doing analysis, uh, you know, and cognitively processing this, processing this information can become defeating. So, um, you know, uh, analysis can grind on the, on the circuits in the left hemisphere of the brain uh, and cause a, a sort of a cognitive load, which we know actually activates the, the stress response as well. You know, and if you're just not in that space, uh, I would wait until you have done all of these other types of things uh, and then engage more deeply here. It will be much more meaningful and successful at that point. Um, and then we've been talking about the, well, we've been, we've been talking about how we really got some terminology out there as a contagion that's taken off uh, that is uh, inaccurate. And that was this idea of social distancing. So uh, we've uh, talked about uh, the fact that we need to physically uh, uh, distance to prevent the spread of the virus, but it's very important that we do everything we can to stay emotionally, uh, socially, and spiritually uh, connected. So, um, you know, that, that's a little challenging right now because we have to do it in a different way, but I think it's worth um, attending uh, to this. And this is where, you know, uh, in some cases, our technology can really grind us down. But in this particular world today, you know, if we're not um, uh, attending to our technology and getting punished by um, social media and marketing and things like that that make us feel inadequate and, and that's why we buy stuff. Um, but anyway, uh, so uh, we uh, can use our technology uh, to connect and this can be done individually or you can develop groups. Um, you know, the face-to-face -face contact is, is really helpful. We were talking about uh, Stephen Porges, Porges earlier and, uh, and some of the stuff around autonomic function and breath work, but he's also done a lot of work uh, in the world of, uh, of our facial expressions and our vocal uh, intonations and how uh, we communicate a lot through that without necessarily using language. Uh, and, uh, and, and so that a smiling face uh, and, uh, and, and a, a calm voice can be very reassuring to us and help to shut down uh, the uh, threat stress response. Um, in fact, the wiring for our uh, facial expression and our, uh, and our voice is all down in this, comes from this part of the brain uh, that helps with uh, uh, increasing our feed and breathe, our rest and digest, and our, our, our sex and relax mode, and decrease our fight or flight, and hopefully prevent us from getting into any freeze and faint physiology. Um, so, and that stuff is absolutely fascinating. Some of the parameters around what you should be looking for, though, in your social and spiritual support is an environment that feels safe, an environment where you feel fully seen, and an environment where you feel secure. So, and this tends to be uh, in groups where uh, it's uh, uh, implied that uh, you're going to act uh, through kindness and compassion, uh, and that you are not going to participate in shaming or blaming or judging or even giving advice, which we all love to do. Um, so we're getting to the bottom of the board here, and I am going to talk about boundaries uh, briefly. So one of the things that um, we do is uh, we have, as human beings that can contemplate their own demise, whether it be a physical uh, annihilation or a social annihilation, a spiritual annihilation, um, you know, we have a fair amount of anxiety around that, uh, that idea. And so um, we go about our lives trying to establish control um, and, um, and, and that helps to quiet that anxiety. Um, the problem is that we really don't have that much control. I mean, this COVID virus is just a 
classic example of the fact that we don't have that much control. I mean, people are getting infected with this and rushing to the hospital uh, for uh, a predictive code that they're going to be uh, cared for and cured when all we really have is supportive measures. We don't have that much control right now over uh, Mother Nature um, and the world around us. And, and we actually really kind of exist like that, uh, it, it, but we don't recognize it. We have a hard time controlling ourselves, right? We've been talking about autonomic or automatic nervous system stuff that we can't control, right? We've been talking about predictive codes and repressions and suppressions that are in our subconscious uh, doing uh, millions more work than what we're doing in our conscious mind and we're not even aware of it. So, how, you know, uh, maybe we're aware of it now today because we're talking about it, but uh, if you're not, you know, how, how, how can you control that? Um, we age, we can't stop it. You know, there's so many things that, uh, that we don't have control over, even ourselves. Uh, and then it's foolish to think that we actually have control uh, over um, other people. Um, and, uh, you know, and at a certain level, it's, it's foolish to think that we have a lot of control over Mother Nature. Uh, you know, we could be kinder to Mother Nature, and that might be advisable uh, to uh, treat Mother Nature with kindness and co compassion would be reasonable. So one of the things that we tend to do when we're, you know, when we're under threat and stress is to try to become more controlling. And there are a myriad of uh, ways that we try to get control over the world. Sometimes we try to control other people. Sometimes we get very hyper-focused on controlling ourselves and our routines and, and, and rituals. Um, and I don't want to go into all that. I just want to lay it out there that a lot of our psychopathology... Um, let, well, let's go back. A lot of our psychopathology initially is related to the threat stress response. And if you uh, go back to the past sessions and look at uh, the threat stress response and how we look in stages of threat and stress, you can see the, um, the mental health issues woven all the way through there, let alone the physical health issues woven all the way through there. Now, when we try to get kind of control over this automatic stuff and this toxic soup that's running through us, uh, and we start exerting control over other people and ourselves, we actually can sort of compound things, and that's where we start seeing additional sort of psychiatric issues such as personality disorders or um, addiction disorders. Um, and I just want to point out that every one of them, those, those, those early behaviors that we see when we're agitated and our dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is offline and our ventral medial prefrontal cortex is offline, those, uh, those things we, we see early on in stress threat and then chronically as it goes on, we start seeing you know, these, these weird, I call them illusion of control strategies where we create this model that we're in control of all this stuff that we have very little control over to try to deal with our anxiety. Instead of dealing with our emotions, we try to control everything and stop them and, and compartmentalize them. So I think this is really important to recognize. And so when you get in that mode where you find that you're needing to, to control things around you, you can step back and go, whoa, I really don't have that much control. And I probably should let go of trying to control everything and everybody, including myself a little bit. Um, but recognize that really what is being signaled to you is you may need to be setting a boundary. There may be things going on uh, in life where you need uh, to uh, set a boundary. So that's you know, really part of a good sort of physical and mental health package is to be skilled at setting boundaries. And that means setting boundaries um, you know, uh, with other people so they're not invading your space, uh, but also recognizing that uh, you need to set boundaries for yourself so that you're not invading other people's space. So people with poor boundaries, the analogy is the intoxicated driver, right? You know, they're, 
they're going down the road, they're going too slow, they're speeding up, they're swerving into somebody else's lane, maybe they're crashing, they're causing a lot of trauma and anxiety, you know, just sort of watching them uh, go down the road. Now, if we all create good boundaries and we all have our our, our lanes and maybe, you know, maybe we need some good guardrails for certain people um, and we don't try to control everything, but we just try to stay in our lane, we're going to find out that we're much more content and we're also going to uh, deactivate this little guy and the threat stress cascade that can become so toxic uh, will start uh, to dissipate. Um, so that that's what I wanted to uh, get out there today. Um, you know, we want to try to get our physiology so we're full of dopamine and feeling confident and, and full of uh, 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 serotonin so we feel uh, kind of chill and connected and we need enough noradrenaline so we're uh, sharp and focused and we can execute stuff that's where we're, where we want to get to and we can get there again by uh, doing the basics and then looking at this list of things that can also be helpful to us um, and I do want to point out uh, one more time as I did in a previous session that this stuff is kind of fun. It is not stuff that is particularly onerous to do, but we have to uh, find the time, take the time uh, uh, to do these things uh, to be uh, fully healthy. Um, thanks.